First Kings chapter 17. We began a study last week on the life of Elijah, and I am really excited about uh, this character study. It'll be about 10 weeks long, just about that. So it won't be a long series, but wow, there is so much in the life of Elijah that you and I just need to know and principles by which we need to live that are just uh, so helpful for everyday living. And I want you to see 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going to read the passage just so we have it in our minds, and then we're going to go back through and give you a couple thoughts from it. So 1 Kings chapter 17, look at verse number 8. 1 Kings 17, verse number 8, where the Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, unto Elijah, saying... Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon. Don't miss that. And dwell there, live there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there, gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, a little oil in a cruise, and behold, I am gathering two sticks." that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me there, thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Look at the last two verses I'll read, verse 15 and 16. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. I want to use these verses that we just read and preach a, a message this morning entitled, uh, When the Commands of God Are Confusing. When the Commands of God Are Confusing. Lord, I pray that you'd bless the time that we have together that we've allocated just to hear the Bible. Lord, we look forward to these times because we know that you speak when your word is preached. We know that you do a work, and we know that your Holy Spirit ultimately is the one who brings these truths to our understanding. And I pray that you would help us to be illuminated in our thinking what this passage means. Help us to be energized in our living, to obey, to follow, to make the changes that we need to make in our lives, that we might live more effectively for the cause of Christ. I pray that you bless the reading of your word, bless our understanding of it, bless most of all our application of it to our own lives. Please be with that one today that does not know Christ. I pray that today especially would be an impactful day for him or for her. Bless this message, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. When the commands of God are confusing. What's interesting about the passage we just read is that there are essentially two commands. There's a command that's given to the prophet of God, and that wouldn't be unusual. Uh, Elijah knows all about what it means to obey God. He's a prophet. Elijah knows all about what it means to follow God. He's been following God for many years. We, we read last week about how he followed God to Samaria, made that proclamation to Ahab. We learned last week about how, how he followed God to the brook Kareth, even though it didn't make sense. Even though God had told them he's going to feed him with ravens. No one had ever done that before. Ravens were unclean birds. And yet uh, Elijah trusted God. Elijah trusted the word of God. And Elijah went to where God told him to go. So Elijah kind of is a veteran 
at obeying the commands of God. And even though the command of God, again, is confusing, even though the command of God, again, doesn't make much sense to Elijah's uh, sensibilities, again, we find Elijah following God, even though the command of God is confusing. But did you catch it when we read the passage a moment ago? There was not only a command given to Elijah that seemed to be confusing, and I'll talk about the reasons why it was confusing, but there was also a command by God given to a widow woman. Did you see that? I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee there. And so God commanded Elijah, but before God ever commanded Elijah, the Bible says he commanded a widow woman because I have commanded her. Did you see the verb tense? I have commanded her. So before God ever commanded Elijah to go, he commanded a woman to sustain him when he got there. So there are two commands. And both commands, humanly speaking, are confusing. Has God ever told you to do something that was confusing? Like in the moment, you're like, God, Lord, that doesn't make sense. Like when God told uh, Moses to go to Egypt. And well, why would God call a, a man with a speech impediment to go to Egypt? Like, like when God said to Moses, throw the rod down upon the ground, it'll become a snake. That sounds like a confusing thing to do. More confusing to me was pick up the snake. Sometimes God tells you to do confusing things. Hey, little lad, give me those two loaves and give me those five fishes and let's see what God does. It would be confusing to me as a young man to give my lunch, not knowing what God would do. Hey, march around the city one time a day for six days. March around seven times on the seventh day. The walls will come tumbling down. That's a confusing command, not hard to obey, but hard to understand. Many times God tells us things that are hard to, not to understand uh, in, in the moment, but uh, hard to understand how God could do it that way. Two commands, both confusing, two different responses to those commands. So first of all, this morning, I want to talk about the commands of God, the commands of God, at least in this passage, and give you some general statements about uh, the expectations that God has for you and for me. Now, you know that, right? You know that God has expectations for your life. Good dads have expectations. Uh, good dads don't have a laissez-faire attitude about their kids. And God has expectations for your life. He wants you to follow him. He's got a, a path for you to walk. He's got things for you to do. I think that's what Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 means. That we have, uh, we're, we're saved unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. God has places for you to go and things for you to do and people for you to meet. And we need to be sensitive to the commands and expectations of God in our life. So watch what happens here in verse number uh, 8 of our text where the Bible says, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying. So the commands of God. I think, first of all, the commands of God often mean, matter of fact, I can hardly find a case where, it's not this, where this is not true. The commands of God mean action. The commands of God mean action. God wants us to act upon what he says. And I think one of the problems we have in modern day Christianity is we have done the switch. And the switch is, we think that Bible Christianity is that we know the commands of God. I can, I can name all the books of the Bible. I can quote uh, X number of verses. I know all the isms, and I know all the ologies, and I can speak uh, the, the theological language, and I can preach uh, and pray flowery prayers. But listen, uh, the, the blessing is not in what you know. That's why uh, James it said, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. It's not about what we hear. It's not about what we know. It's about what we do. Uh, the, the Bible says, he that, uh, he, the, he, he that heareth the word and, do, and doesn't do it, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's the Bible, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man, the doer, this man shall be blessed in the deed. That's why uh, James goes on to say in James chapter 2 that faith without works is dead because works are the indicator that faith is real. And so uh, commands of God mean action. You know that God moved Elijah a number of different times. As we study the book of Elijah, or the, the, book, of, the book of Elijah, see, I'm making up books of the Bible now. As we study the book of 1 Kings, uh, we learn about the life of Elijah, God moved him. 
And God always moved him by his word. Isn't that interesting? God always moved Elijah by his word. So in verse number one, God moved him to Ahab. Give this message. In verse number two, he moved him to the brook Kareth. I'm going to take care of you there. In verse number eight, nine, he moves him up to Zarephath. In chapter 18 and verse one, he moves him back to Ahab. In chapter 19 and verse 15, he moves him from Mount Horeb back to anoint some people, some leaders, civil and religious leaders in Israel. It seems like every time that Elijah is in a place of God's choosing, God gives his word and says, Elijah, go. And I find that significant for two reasons. Number one, God does not have to give you his word to stay. See, sometimes erroneously we think that God has to come to me and clarify that I need to stay where I am. God does not have to clarify for you to stay in a God-given place. For instance, God has called you to that marriage, stay. He didn't have to affirm to you every week, well, you know, she's still the one. Okay, God, is she still the one? No, she's still the one, okay? He's still the one. Okay, God doesn't have to clarify for you to stay. He, God, God led you and now abide in the calling to which God has led you unless God leads you out. By the way, God's not going to lead you out of that one. Okay, what's the point? The point here is that Elijah, uh, Elijah was moved by the word of God. And my question to you this morning is, does the, move, does the word of God move you? Does the word of God move you? Does the word of God have any, uh, 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 have any palpable effect in your life that, that my, my decisions are different and my actions are different and my places are different, my, my life is different because of the word of God in my life? There are expectations. As God's commands require action. But not only do God's commands require action, number two, God's commands are not mutually exclusive. You say, okay, Pastor Skelly, what do you mean by that? God's commands are not mutually exclusive. Okay, what I mean by that is this. God is sovereign. God sees over all of us. And God does not lead you uh, in a way that he is, uh, in a, he does not lead us in ways that are mutually exclusive. In other words, if God was calling him to go to a widow in Zarephath, then he was calling a widow to care for him there. Why? Because God's not schizophrenic. So God's going to work in both of those lives in a way to accomplish his will because his commands are not mutually exclusive. If God's going to tell Peter, go up and talk to Cornelius, I prepared, for him, I prepared him there, then he's also talked to Cornelius to prepare for him as Peter's coming. If God's going to send Philip down to the backside of a desert to speak to an Ethiopian eunuch, when, Peter, when uh, Philip gets there, it should, be no, it should be no surprise that God is already speaking to him through his word. Because sometimes the idea we get when God prompts us to talk to someone about Christ is, well, I, I'll, I'll never be able to convince them. I'll never be able to talk to them. I'm not brave enough. I'm not eloquent enough. I'm not knowledgeable enough. But what we forget is that if God's speaking to me to go, then God's speaking to them to hear. Uh, and don't discount what God is doing already in somebody's life, even though you don't know it. And so in 1 Kings chapter 17, uh, God is moving in Elijah's life, but he's also and simultaneously moving in the life of this widow woman. Why? Because God's commands are not mutually exclusive. So number one, God's commands mean action. Number two, God's commands are not mutually exclusive. And then number three, God's commands can initially be confusing. And that's the point of my message. God's commands can initially be confusing. Now, I want you to think about just how confusing these commands were to the respective people. First of all, how confusing this command must have been to Elijah. Now, he obeyed. He obeyed, but, but how confusing it must have been. Okay, Elijah, I want you to leave this place where I've provided for you. Now, what, why? Why would God, I mean, the raven thing is working, right? It's working. And I'm pretty sure that God can make water come from a brook if he can make ravens feed me. So God, well, you're already feeding me. You're already working in my life. You're already protecting me. No one knows I'm here. I mean, why would God lead me anywhere else? Well, I don't know. That's, that's, God has his reasons. And we don't always know God's reasons, but it, it might not make sense for Elijah to leave. Okay, for three reasons. Okay, Elijah, leave here. Go to Zidon. You say, where's Zidon? Well, Zidon is where Jezebel's from. Now, now, now you have your Bible open. Look, look back at chapter 16. That was not, not a well-timed well there, George, okay? But uh, 
Almost makes you, me think like you know something I don't know, okay? <laughs> Look at 16, the verse 31. And the Bible says, And it came to pass, as, it, as if it had been a light thing for him, for Ahab, to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, he was the first king of the divided northern kingdom, the son of Nebat. Look at this, verse 31. That he, Ahab, took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians. Huh. So uh, Jezebel is the princess from Zidon. She's the princess of Zidon. And the Bible says, and she, she, he went and served Baal and worshiped him. So Jezebel is from the epicenter of Baal worship. Her dad's like the chief Baal guy. And when Ahab marries Jezebel, and she brings her God with her. And so Jezebel goes to Samaria, the capital of Israel, and Ahab's like, yeah, well, we want to do better agriculturally. We want to be more blessed. And we've heard that Baal, he's a good luck charm too. So we're not going to give up on our God, but we're going to add your God to the mix. So he built a temple to Baal. That's what started this whole thing. That's what started the whole thing. So now what's God doing? God is sending Elijah right back up to where Baal's from. I mean, this is just, I hate to say it this way, but God's kind of like saying, in your face. Because now Baal is down in Israel, and Ahab's saying, this is our new God, this is our new religion, and he's going to help us. And, and God's about to show in the very birthplace of Baal that Baal is nobody. So God has his reasons. But to Elijah, he's thinking, what in the world? I'm trying to get away from Baal, and God's sending me to Baal. God's sending me to this city called Zarephath in Zidon. Listen, I'm not going to be culturally accepted. This is culturally confusing. Why would God send a, a follower of Jehovah? Why would God send a, a Jew up to uh, Zidon? This makes no cultural sense. Number two, it was confusing uh, ethically. It's confusing culturally. Why would God send me there? There's no commonality whatsoever. Number two, why would God send me there and ask a widow to help me? Like, why, why would God take me and go to a person more desperate than I am and ask them for help? Now, we've all needed, needed help from time to time in our lives, but when you need help, usually you go to somebody that has more than you have. Usually when you need help, you go to somebody that's better off than you are. You usually don't go down to the street corner and find the first homeless person and say, hey, listen, I need a loan, okay? It doesn't work that way. So here is, although with some of them, I think I probably could get a loan, but anyway. <laughs> the, the point here is that this is a woman that truly is desperate. Here's a woman that truly does have problems. And if you want to find the poster child for desperation in the Bible, it's always a widow. It's always a widow. You look throughout the Bible, the poster child for desperation is a widow. That's why God puts such a high premium on caring for widows. That's why in Acts chapter 6, it's like, hey, the problem is caring for widows. That's why in 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, Paul gives an entire, uh, half of an entire chapter to caring for widows. That's why James says in James chapter 1, that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And so widows were a big deal to God. And now God's saying, I want you to go and take from a widow. I mean, did not Jesus excoriate the religious leaders of his day for that very thing? In Matthew chapter 23, he said to them, it's somewhere there in about 14 or 15, right in that section there, he said, ye devour widows' houses. You take advantage of people like widows. How dare you? And now God is telling Elijah, Go get a meal, not just a meal, but go stay with, not just go stay with, but have her feed you every day, a widow. That's confusing. It was culturally confusing. It was ethically confusing. It was logically confusing. Why would God send me, who has next to nothing, but at least has been fed by ravens, to go to a person that has nothing? This makes no sense. It was a confusing command. But you know, Elijah responded. Elijah responded. Elijah obeyed the command of God. 
And I think maybe Elijah's thinking was this, the God that can feed me through ravens, which didn't make sense, is a God that can feed me through a widow, and that doesn't make sense. The situation has changed, but God has not changed. The situation has changed, but God's word has not changed. Do you know that that's what God wants you to do? Because if God always helped us the same way, then what's going to happen is our faith actually switches from God to the way. Like, I'm not trusting God. I'm trusting the refrigerator because that's where the food is. I'm not trusting God because God's always provided through my job. I'm trusting my job. I hope my job doesn't go away. I'm not trusting God. I'm trusting my dad. I'm trusting my husband. I'm trusting my wife. I'm trusting my provider. I'm trusting my... So sometimes God mixes up the ways because we put our trust in the wrong places. Does that make sense? So what happened in Jesus' ministry is he fed 5,000 with two loaves and five fishes. And then they got in a boat that night, the disciples did, and they struggled in the winds and the waves. And Jesus came walking on the water. They were scared. They thought it was a ghost. Finally realized it was Jesus. And the whole walking on the water, Peter, the whole thing. The Bible says in Mark 6 that that the, the boat came to shore and the disciples were amazed. Like they were astonished. Like, I can't believe we're alive. And then the Bible added this commentary. Don't miss it. In Mark 6. And the commentary was this. They were amazed, not because it was a good thing, it was a bad thing. Their hearts were hardened because they considered not the miracle of the loaves. In other words, they should have known that a God that can feed thousands is a God that can save in a storm. There wasn't anything magical about bread, and there was nothing magical about the sea. There is something pretty supernatural about God. And so God wants our trust to be in him, not in his ways. And Elijah has learned it's the word of God that has never steered me wrong. It's the word of God that has never led me to the wrong wrong place. And I've received confusing commands before, but I've just done what God told me to do, and God is blessed. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to simply trust him, only believe, Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. O-B-E-D-I-E-N-C-E. Obedience is the very best way to show that we believe. You're welcome for that tune (laughs) that you'll be humming all day. What's the point? The point is God wants us to trust him. So what did Elijah do? He just got walking. He just got walking. He didn't know everything. He didn't know the, the, the address of this woman. He, he, he knew one thing. It's a widow, and she's at this place, this town. That's all he knew. But he knew enough to leave. See, our problem is we want to know everything before we take one step. No, step in what you know. Step, go, go to what you know, and God will reveal as you go. That's the way God works. He started walking. Look at verse number 11. He started talking. I love it. Verse number, uh, verse number 10, rather. And so he rose. There he is. He starts walking. He went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, that's the front door, before he ever got in the city where the woman lived, the widow woman was there. Isn't that so good about God? God's like, hey, listen, I'm going to make it obvious. You know, he's looking, going to look for a widow woman in town. He didn't know her address. He doesn't to go to the white pages. If you don't know what white pages are, you are way, way, way too young, okay? He didn't go to the white pages. He didn't go to his Google directory. And by the way, who ever thought that you'd have to pay to get someone's phone number anymore? How about the good old days when you could just look it up, right? Now you got to Google someone's name, pay money. Anyway, so uh, verse number uh, 10, she was there gathering sticks. And he called. Hey, he got walking. He got talking. And God did his thing. You know, God will do his thing in your life if you'll obey what you know to obey. Just do the stuff that you already know you're supposed to do. Quit being paralyzed by, quit being paralyzed by analyzing every, you know, which way. Well, if I do this, then this might happen. And God, if you'll make this clear, and Lord, if you'll let me know how this is going to work out six months from now. Listen, what do you know that you're supposed to do today? Do it. What do you know is inhibiting a God's a blessing in your life today? Stop doing it. 
get it right. Just start walking. Just start talking and see what God does with simple obedience. Elijah is a great pattern for us. But then lastly, this morning, not only do I see a, co- a co- confusing command to Elijah and the way that he responded, but notice the confusing command to this woman and how she responded. And this is so interesting. Look back, if you would, one more time at verse number nine, the initial statement where he says to Elijah, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, Jezebel's place. Dwell there. Watch this. Behold, I, do you see the verb there? I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee there. I have commanded. So, hey, Elijah, don't worry about it. I already set this thing up. Elijah, I want you to go there. I know it sounds culturally offensive. I know, I know it sounds ethically confusing. I know it's a, a logically puzzling to you to go, Elijah, but, but, but I'm telling you to go, and I'm telling you this, I have already spoken to her about this. Now, how did God speak to this woman? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Did he just impress it upon her heart? Did he speak to her audibly? The Bible doesn't say. All we know is that God made it clear that he expected her to take care of him because that's what the Bible says. So how did she respond to that command? And think about it. She was told, you're going to take care of the prophet of God. And I mean, that was days. She had to wait days for that because Elijah walking from Kareth to Zarephath, right? That would take a number of days. That's probably a week and a half journey. So let's assume that God had told the widow woman at about the same time. Well, she's running out of food. God told her, you're going to have to take care of my prophet. And every day, she has less food and less food and less food and less food. So finally, she says to her son, I'm going to go out and get some sticks and we're going to have one last meal and we're going to die. So it's like God's timing is impeccable. It's like God told her something and now it looks like that something's not going to come fast because she's been waiting, 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 waiting and God, you said, you said, you said, you said and it looks like it's not going to happen, right? So Elijah shows up. There she is, picking up sticks, making fire. Elijah said, hey, get me a cup of water. Didn't even say please. Get me a cup of water. Now, Elijah doesn't know which woman it is. I think what Elijah was doing here is just saying, well, I'm here at the city. That's the first widow I see. Let's try her. I mean, the Bible doesn't say, but I mean, the Bible also doesn't say that he knows who it is. So he, go get me some water and watch what happens. So she goes. No response. She just begins to obey. And I think it was at that moment that Elijah realized, oh, it's her. Because no one does that naturally. You know, no, no Zidonian, Baal-worshipping woman is going to take a Jewish prophet's word and say, okay, yes, sir. She goes to get a cup of water, just a little water. And, and so as she's going, verse number 10, do you see that? Uh, chapter 17, verse number 10. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her. So she's going to get the water. He said, oh, hey, 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 and I'll take some bread with that too. Right? It's kind of like you go to the drive-thru, you order your thing, and say, would you like fries with that? Yes. Yes, I would. As a matter of fact, give me, right? That's what he's saying. Hey, I want to add to my order. I want water. I want bread. So she's received a confusing command from God. Go care for this, care for this prophet when he shows up. Well, then he doesn't show up. He doesn't show up. He doesn't show up. He doesn't show up. And now I'm going to die. Now I'm going to die. And then he shows up at the worst possible time. He shows up when I really don't have anything to give him except for the stuff I need for my son. See, it's the worst possible time. And the prophet says, okay, get me the water, get me the bread. Now we see her response. Look at it, verse number 12. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth. It's not the Lord my God. She, she's not in this picture. Your God spoke to me, but he's not, she's not, he's not my God. As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake. You're asking me to get you something I don't have. 
All I have is a handful of meal, handful, a little oil, enough maybe to make a cake, but I don't even have one available. That's why I'm getting these sticks that I may go dress it for me, okay, for my son. You're asking it for you, but no, this is for me. This is for my son, okay, and we're going to eat it and we're going to die. So that's her response. Well, wait a minute. God told her, take care of him. But she's reluctant to obey God now because all I have left is enough for me and for my son. So I'm not going to do what God told me to do. Is, is there a teaching here for us? Is, is there a teaching here for me? I think there is. Because the question that we ask ourselves is this. Why are we reluctant to obey the clear command of God? I want you to think about that in your own life. Why are you reluctant to obey what God has clearly told you to do? In whatever area that is. I think she was reluctant for these reasons. I think, first of all, she was reluctant because she knew about God, but she didn't know God. I think she was reluctant because she knew about God, but she didn't know God. She knew that God was real. He had spoken to her. She knew that God was the God of Elijah. He said, she said that to Elijah. But he's not my God. And therefore, I don't have any obligation to follow him. I know about him, but I don't really know him. See, there is a relational pull when you know God that's not there when you don't know him. Like if someone comes up to me at Walmart and says, hey, can I have $10? And we're like, I don't know you. I don't know what you're going to use that for. But if my kids say, dad, I need $10, there it is. What else do you need? What? There's a relationship. This woman says, there is no obligation for me to obey because he's not my God. And maybe that's the reason why some of you struggle with obeying God. And maybe there's no real bona fide relationship there. Because relationship will have a natural pull. Number two, I think she said, uh, n- number one, I'm not obligated. I, have no, I know about God, but I don't know God. He's your God, not mine. And by the way, I have no extra food. So the implication is, hey, if I had extra food, if you showed up early, I'd help you out. But I, I, I'm, down to, it's, I'm down to it's just me or you. I'm down to this is the last meal. I don't have any extra. For me to give you food is for me to take food away from me and away from my, I have no extra. So therefore, I'm not going to give you. I, 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 I'm not able to. I, I can't obey God because I'm not obligated. I can't obey God because I, I'm not able to. I don't have the resources to do so. And then thirdly, I can't obey God because somebody that I love needs that food. My son, are you telling me, uh, mister, are you telling me to give you food that I'm going to, this is my last meal. Are you telling me to give my last meal to you, a stranger, instead of my son? Is that what you're asking me to do? No way. Let me tell you what this food's for. It's for me and my son. Why? Because I have loyalties that supersede the loyalty you expect me to have to your God. Why do we struggle obeying God? I think we struggle obeying God for the same reasons. Number one, we don't feel obligated because there's not a strong relationship. Number two, we feel like, you know, I can't. Lord, I'm I'm, I'm strapped right now. If I had more time, if I had more resources, if I had more at my disposal, then maybe I'd give you some overflow. But no, no, God, I can't. I'm not able. And by the way, God, I'm unwilling because I have loyalties in my life that supersede my loyalty to you. So... There's that. Wow. We're seeing a real issue, aren't we? In the confusing command that she has received. So here's how it resolves, right? And we're done. Here's how it resolves. So Elijah helps her understand why following God is her best option. By the way, that, that's what Bible teachers should do. That's what pastors should do. That's what dads should do. That's what moms should do. You ought to be arguing in a good sense. You ought to be making the case that following God is always the best thing you can do. It's always the best thing. It's best for your life. And it's best for all the lives of those around you. So watch how Elijah does that in verse number number 13. 
How does Elijah deal with her reluctance? How should we deal with our own reluctance to obey God? Verse number 13. And Elijah said unto her, fear not. Well, because the first thing that we have to deal with is our own fear. So why is she not serving God? Why is she not obeying God? Even though God has commanded her to do so, because she's afraid. She's afraid that if I give to God, if I give to God, I'll have nothing for myself. If I give to God, the people I love will suffer. If I give to God, she has a million reasons why she can't. Same excuses we give. And so Elijah says, don't be afraid. The thing you have to conquer first is your fear. And the way to conquer fear is not to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The way to conquer fear is not to say, well, just be brave, be strong. Yeah, as if there's some kind of a, a mental kind of state we have to enter. Like just grit your teeth. No, the opposite of fear of the Bible is not bravery. The opposite of fear of the Bible is faith. Faith in something. And what Elijah said is, listen, you don't have to be afraid because God told you. And when God tells you, God always guides where he, he always provides where he guides. He always feeds where he leads. So he's helping her to see this is not about do, do, do. This is about a God that's already done it, that wants to include you in it. This is a God that wants to show himself strong. It's not about the circumstance. It's about the God of the circumstance, right? So don't fear. Deal with fear first. The number one command of the Bible is fear not. Number one command of the Bible is fear not. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, of a sound mind. God's done that work on the inside. It's who you are. Uh, you are God's uh, ch child. You are uh, identified with Christ. You have the Holy Spirit of power living inside of you. God has a plan for your, for your future, and you can trust him. Uh, be away with fear. Trust him. So deal with your fear first. Number two, obey what you know. Obey what you know. So don't try to figure out how the groceries are going to be, get there tomorrow, is what she's saying, he's saying. Listen, what, I, what God told you to do is fairly straightforward. You need to feed the prophet. There's going to be enough for you, but you need to obey first. Obey for simply trust him. Only believe. Trust. So deal with your fear. Obey what you know. And then number three, Trust God to do what you can. You say, but yeah, if I, if, I, if I act in faith and do what I know, then what about, yeah, no, no, God's, God's about the whatabouts. No, no, our only job is to okay, deal with our fear, trust God, do what he said, and then God deals with the whatabouts. And, and what Elijah did very graciously for this woman as he told her how God would deal with the what about. Look at verse number 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, don't miss it, the barrel of meal. And don't picture this, okay? Don't picture a barrel. Oh, yeah, a barrel of meal, wow. You know, like a barrel full of monkeys, right? No, a barrel was just a container. The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil, hey, just a small little thing of oil, the barrel, the cruise, shall not fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain. Hey, my God is the rain God, not your God. My God is the provider. And until God finishes teaching his lesson to your false God, and until our God finishes teaching his lesson, he's going to show you how faithful he is. Because your little container and your little container are not going to run out until God sends rain. Look at verse number uh, 15. And she did. She went and did. There it is. Just like Elijah. Hey, just, yeah, she started walking. She started talking. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. Like weeks and months and probably a couple years. And the barrel of meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he, came, which, which he spake by Elijah. All right, last thing I want to say. Do you know that Jesus talked about this woman? You know that, right? You know that in the New Testament, Jesus talked about this woman. 
when he was being rejected by his own hometown in Nazareth, Jesus said, hey, listen, there were all kinds of widows in Israel when Elijah lived, but God sent him to her. There were all kinds of lepers in Israel when Elisha lived, but God sent Naaman to him. What's the point? God had a purpose for this girl, this lady, this young widow with a small son. God knew all about her. He knows all about you, okay? And watch this final statement. I wrote it down because I didn't want to mess it up. Listen to this. The future for this woman, listen, was a day-by-day experience of fullness, The future was a day-by-day experience of fullness. God didn't build her a storehouse. God didn't say, okay, I'm going to give you enough food for two years because that's how much is long. That's that's the length of the drought. So there's your big barn. There's your refrigerated section. There's the uh, dry food section. Didn't do that. He didn't fill a storehouse. He didn't allow, what he did is he didn't allow a barrel or a cruise to run out. Here it is. Fullness is not in the resources we hoard. Fullness is in the faithful daily provisions God provides. Fullness is not in the resources. We want to be full by saying, God, I never have to worry about my retirement. I never have to worry about my future. I never have to worry about next month. And what God wants is he wants you to trust him every day single day. And if you'll trust him every single day, you know what you'll find out? Every single day is full. Why? Because God is there. So quit looking down the road. Trust him today. See God grow your faith and respond with obedience to even the most confusing command.